Morning, Sharon. Morning, Howard. Thanks for dragging me downtown. <laughs> um, this, this is a really inspiring story of a comeback that was not guaranteed to happen by any stretch. Um, you know, when, uh, I met you in, I think, 2005 um, when Starbucks was really at the height of its power, of its first domination, you can almost say, of consumer culture and, and, and coffee and uh, the, the many things that Starbucks came to represent and ultimately become a target because of the, the, the dominant position right. that it had. Um, and I've, we've been friends through the, through the decline and as you've brought the company back and it's just been an incredibly inspiring thing to observe and to read about in this book, which you tell so well. What was the first stomach crunching moment when you realized that all of the things that you were being told internally, like we're fine, things are growing, we're, ch you know, and you might be hearing things from friends that are sort of maybe in the back of your mind, but what was the moment where, if there was one, where you thought things are not right yeah. at this company? Well, there's never one moment, uh, but I think in, in order to frame the story, uh, you almost have to go back to the beginning and understand that uh, we set out uh, many years ago to build a different type of business model, uh, not better than anyone else, but somewhat different. And that was a, uh, a business model designed to achieve the fragile balance between profitability and a social conscience. And what was linked to that more than anything else was understanding that we wanted to build the kind of company that took care of our, of our people. And primarily, there were two unique benefits at the time. This was uh, when we were a private company, still losing money, and we, we created uh, comprehensive health insurance for our people and equity in the form of stock options, all of which was, was even for part-timers. And uh, I say that because it's important to understand that as we were growing the company, what was, I think, so uh, gratifying is that we were sharing the success not only with our shareholders, but with our people. Um, in February of 07, uh, I wrote this memo, and uh, it was never intended to be a public memo, but it leaked. And it was a memo that was somewhat critical of where the, what the company was doing and what I thought we were standing for. And in a sense, uh, the memo was written because I thought we were measuring and rewarding the wrong activities. And we were no longer focused on the customer, we were no longer focused on our people, we were focused on growth. And growth became uh, a, a virus inside the company in which many ways it, it began to cover up mistakes. It wasn't one thing, but it was a series of activities that I could just feel intuitively was causing a deep concern. Now, I wrote this memo at a time when the stock price was at its all-time high, and many people were focused on that as a primary metric for how healthy the company was. But a company can't be defined by its stock price. It has to be defined by its relationship with its customers, its core purpose, its values, its guiding principles. And I thought we were really losing our way in which the growth and success of the company was covering up mistakes. But it, it turned out that as 2007 unfolded, the results in the company supported what your antenna, if you like, were telling you. So that's what I'm curious about is, how did your antenna feel it and your CEO at the time yeah. did not? Yeah. I was the chairman of the company, and I think it's important to say, and I've said this throughout the last couple of weeks, uh, even though I was not the CEO, I was as culpable as anyone else in being part of the problem because I was, I was ignoring it. But I also was in a situation where I had no power. Uh, I wasn't running the company and I was trying to be supportive of the CEO. Uh, but what happened post the memo was a series of results that began to demonstrate that the underbelly of the company was not as healthy as it once was. And then that resulted not by intent, because I had no intent of coming back whatsoever, of me actually coming back uh, as CEO in January of 08. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Yeah, so in 2007, you write in the book that the growth in store traffic was down, that the amount of money per customer was down. These are the things that you're successively seeing. The stock was down by the end of 2007 by 42%, and the daily numbers, your comps, which you refer to, were starting to go down in a way that they never had. So this has got to be incredibly worrisome to you at the same time as you're being, you're being told internally that, that you're, that you're crazy or that, or well, that, that you're, that, um, that this is the natural progression of a company that's gotten this big and therefore, hmm. you know, you've, you've, maybe you've maxed out, maybe you're just mature as a company and that that's what's going to Yeah. Happen. Well, the context I think is the following. We, we had 15 consecutive years of creating unbelievable value for every constituent that related to Starbucks. We were on this magical carpet ride where everything we touched almost seemed to turn to gold. Every city, every new initiative, every country. And the virus that came into the company uh, in many ways was the feeling inside the business that Starbucks was invincible. I felt very strongly that what I sensed was hubris and arrogance. Uh, you know, but if you look at the history of many businesses, this is something that is not an anomaly to Starbucks. That it, we just had runaway success and as a result of that, things began to happen that, that just tore away the basic essence of what we once stood for. And then, for the first time in our history, we began to see negative comp store sales at Starbucks. And that, began, that became an opportunity for me to really kind of dig in and say, this problem is not going away, and in fact, it's going to get worse. This must have been kind of terrifying. You're a public company, one of the leading uh, figures in American business, and you're about to make a decision that basically says, which you're never supposed to do, right? Wall Street's like, I, we were wrong. We, well, we've made mistakes. Yeah. That, that's... Well, I, I think the hardest thing for any public company is to stand up and say, we've got a significant problem in the business. But when I came back in January of 08, uh, it was clear to me that one of the things that we had to do was speak with great honesty and transparency both to our people in the marketplace. And in the first three months of me coming back, uh, we began to do two things that were, were very, very unorthodox. And some of you might remember, the first thing we did was we closed every single store for retraining. Can you imagine standing up in front of the world and saying we have to retrain our people? And the reason we had to do that is because, going back to what I said earlier about measuring and rewarding the wrong things, we were not measuring and rewarding the perfect shot of espresso or the perfect beverage or customer service. What we were, what we were measuring and rewarding were customers per hour, transactions per hour, and how to create more revenue in our stores. So, so you know, the, the whole idea of closing the store for retraining was an unbelievable admission to everyone involved, internally, externally, competition, Wall Street, that we, we had significant problems. But it also was the beginning of speaking uh, with unbelievable honesty about how deep the problems were. And I knew that we couldn't begin to transform Starbucks unless we took a big step back and returned the company back to its core values. Secondarily, we did something else, and I think this is an important moment. Um, not only did we have self-induced mistakes at Starbucks that we had to deal with, but when I was coming back on the heels of that, we were dealing with the cataclysmic financial crisis of the recession. And overnight, Starbucks for some reason became the poster child for excess. And, uh, I mean, you can laugh, but it wasn't funny at the time. Uh, where, and then McDonald's was putting up billboards around the country that said $4 is dumb. And, uh, you know, that really pissed us off. Uh, uh, but, uh, so, the second thing we did was understanding something vitally important. And uh, I think it's important to understand that, that unlike almost any consumer brand that you could identify, Starbucks' relationship with its customers and the equity of the Starbucks brand was not built in a traditional sense through marketing and traditional advertising. It was built qu quintessentially by the experience. And that experience comes to life by our people. We are a people-based company. So the second thing we had to do was understand how can we effectively communicate 
with the most important person in all of Starbucks, which is the store manager. So we decided we were going to have a meeting with 11,000 people, the store managers of the North American business. And then the question was, how are we going to do this and where? And how much was it going to cost? Well, people internally and externally were very critical of me at the time saying, how much is this going to cost and how could you justify it? you'll be shocked to know the cost was $32.5 million to have a meeting for three days with all our people. And when I came under such pressure, I asked a rhetorical question. And I said, in, in this kind of crisis, can you tell me a better investment that we could make than an investment in our people? So we went forward with the meeting. Now, we had every municipality in America vying for this meeting because at the time, no businesses we're traveling. You remember when things were just shut down? And we literally had a bake-off of municipalities coming in to present to us. And as soon as the people from New Orleans came in, we realized that these people have such like-minded values to our own. So we took the meeting to New Orleans. Before we spent one hour meeting with our people, we committed 50,000 hours of community service, primarily in the Ninth Ward, uh, where we really uh, provided real valuable contributions. And what we really were trying to do, I think, was rekindle and remind people of the guiding principles and culture of the company. And then we had the meeting. I know this is a long-winded answer, but it's important. No, it's just, uh, I, I've heard, I, I, could, I, could, I wish you brought the, I wish you brought yeah. the video, because it's just incredible. Uh, so I stood in front of 11,000 people after, the, after the, the community service day, and I basically took them through 25 minutes of explaining the situation. Now, as a leader, especially as a man, we are taught uh, perhaps not to be too emotional, never to cry, uh, and, and demonstrate strength and conviction. When I think about that moment and what I try and describe in the book, there's a word in business that is not generally used, and it's love. I love this company. And aside from my family, there isn't anything I wouldn't do for Starbucks and the responsibility that goes with it. And when I stood in front of 11,000 people, I described how desperate the situation was. And it was dire. We had lost $21 billion in market cap in less than a year. The stock was below $10 a share. Competition smelled blood. The crisis was causing tremendous problems inside and outside the company. And people were losing faith. And the press was brutal. The bloom is off the rose, Starbucks' best days are over. The board made a wrong decision in bringing Schultz back. He doesn't have a clue about what to do, all of these things. And I asked people to understand the three things that I needed them to understand. The first was what it means not to be a bystander. That every single situation that occurs in your store matters more than ever before. And if you overlook one thing, then all the other positive things we're doing that day is going to be diminished. And everything matters more than anything else. You can no longer be a bystander. And if you are, you're going to become part of the problem. The second and third thing is, what does it mean to really take things personally? And thirdly, what does it mean to really be personally accountable to the outcome in terms of responsibility? And framing all of that, to really understand that it's not about 17,000 stores and 200,000 people who work for the company and 60 million customers a week. We can't operate at that level anymore. We have to reduce it down to the lowest common denominator. One store, one Starbucks partner, one extraordinary cup of coffee, and the mission of exceeding the expectations of every customer. And I also said, as leaders and managers, we all have to understand we cannot exceed the expectations of our customers unless we as leaders exceed the expectations of our people. And the promise I made is we will transform the company financially, but it will not be success if we leave our people behind. We must do this in a way in which the culture and values of the company are embraced, preserved, and enhanced. And I think we left New Orleans literally on fire with 11,000 people all facing in the same direction, realizing that the power and the destiny of the company was not in the hands of people outside, but was in our hands. And that began the transformation of the company, and that was in the middle of 08.
Yeah. It really is uh, uh, amazing because you talk consistently. This is a, a business book, and you talk consistently through the book about people and humanity, which are not terms they teach at Harvard Business School. And you talk a lot about love. Uh, you also uh, took on the, the issues one by one in a kind of, I think I wrote in my notes, like D-Day <laughs> kind of attack of uh, looking at innovation, new products, um, practical things about how you reestablish a connection with a customer such as, I, I found it really amazing, the, what you saw to be a big problem that the espresso machines were too high and therefore the baristas couldn't actually, uh, the customers couldn't see what the right. baristas were doing and so, uh, you know, Talk, let's talk about sure. some of those things that you went about, you know, finding a cup of coffee that you could charge. I, well, let's talk about the McDonald's for a second. Let's okay. talk about that, right? You, you, you don't like a four, the, the, the phrase $4 latte or whatever, but you could have, you know, slashed your prices, right? Yeah. And it was a new mindset. American consumers were re are really watching their pennies. And how do you shift the perception of, this is not a luxury that you can't afford, that you're right. gonna cut out of your day. This is something, but at the same time, without slashing your prices and then going, you know, then it's a race to the bottom. Okay, so you asked me a number of questions. I know, that was too many questions. Uh, let's, we just uh, talk about McDonald's. It's like, I, uh, okay, let's talk about McDonald's. You I can't even remember the third one. Okay, sorry. <laughs> well, let me, let me, let me try and- I my, have this problem, I'm sorry. Let me, okay. let me try and, and, and navigate through some of that. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'll just go away. I mean, okay. <laughs> no. He doesn't uh, need me. He really doesn't. The, <laughs> the second thing is, the, we are obviously the issue that we were facing was that uh, with regard to there, the cloud on the company was self-induced mistakes, which we owned, as well as the, the, the crisis of the recession of a and a seismic change in consumer behavior. The world is and I think... Um, thing, no there was a rush to judgment to break by many voice, people that perhaps this was a time to so change the strategy of the company. The Maybe franchise all the stores or start discounting the coffee and all different types of things. And there was tremendous way. pressure. With the, with I write the in the book that uh, my phone rang one day and the third uh, thing in the middle of the crisis from an institutional shareholder that I had known for more than 10 years who said to me, uh, this is the moment where you can, for the first time, cut your health care benefit. And, they're so and uh, well I think this is an important isolated mo uh, thing to talk about. Uh, believe it or not, our health care cost in the last 12 months was about $250 million to preserve the health care benefit for our people. And uh, the investors said, every company is slashing this benefit. You have complete license to do it. Uh, you have to do this now. And that conversation was very short because the, the very essence of the fabric of the company is linked to that benefit. But more than that, the, the most important attribute of building an, an enduring enterprise of any kind with your own people and your customer is a characteristic of trust. And I, I understood early on that this was a real test for all of us, that what did we really stand for and how much confidence and faith did we have in our core purpose. Now, not in a naive way, and so that conversation was very short, and obviously we, we were unwilling to cut that. But the same thing was true with discounting the coffee or buying lower quality coffee or franchising our stores. We had to solidify our strategy and our core purpose by recognizing that we couldn't embrace the status quo as an operating principle. And we had to push for relevant innovation, recognizing that we had to push for reinvention and self-renewal. But what we were unwilling to do and I would suggest if we did, we wouldn't be here. We were unwilling to fracture the humanity of the company. Now, let me go back to something that relates to McDonald's in a way, and that is the seismic change in consumer behavior. We are witness right now to, I think, three <laughs> legs of that stool. Uh, the first one is that the, the, the downturn in the economy and the recession has a long tail with regard to how the consumer is, is acting. And whether the economy improves or not, and for me, I don't think we're gonna see any significant improvement for 12 to 18 months, is the, 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 the consumer is now imprinted with a new way of buying things, primarily because they have less money. 
And as a result of that, every company, every enterprise is, has, will have to work much, much harder to get that customer's loyalty and business. That's not going away. The second thing is we are obviously witnessing a unbelievable sea change with regard to digital and social media. And as a result of that, traditional marketing, traditional advertising, and all the rules of engagement the last 50 years of building a brand or communicating with the outside world is changing. For one thing, no one has enough dollars to break through the noise through traditional methods. So every company must invest in the capability and the discipline of understanding how to build a relationship in a very unique way with, the, with your customers through social and digital media. And the third thing, which I think is not being written about as much as it will be, is because there's parity in the marketplace, the customer today has lots of choices. And they're so well informed because of social and digital media that their buying decisions is not only going to be based on price and features and benefits of a product. It's going to be based on a company's values, integrity, and ethics. The customer wants to know how you're treating your people, your involvement in the community. And those businesses that are authentically doing the right thing, not issuing a press release or not doing this for, for the sake of marketing, but genuinely really doing it for the right reasons, are going to engender a level of trust and confidence with the consumer that will be enduring and sustainable. Those three seismic changes for us, I think, gave us an opportunity to withstand the competitive pressures that were coming from lots of companies, including McDonald's. The values of the company, the relationship we have with our people and our customers is something I think people understand. We became, in 18 months, the number one brand on Facebook, Twitter, and Foursquare because we understood the significant advantage competitively of becoming best of class. And then we created a value proposition around the Starbucks Rewards Program and understanding how to create a value proposition without diluting the integrity of the premium position of Starbucks without discounting the brand. I think that's really one of the most interesting things that's in the book. Well, you're a coffee company, and there's a moment of clarity that you have when you realize that, you, that Starbucks has to actually get engaged in the digital revolution, too. And it's not an intuitive connection at all because you're engaged in bricks and mortar stores and the physical experience of buying an actual cup of coffee. So what would digital have to do with that? Uh, and, and it's really remarkable how you went out and well, I, I, what you describe in the book is all of this incoming criticism coming to you through the blogosphere and then having a moment when you realize that, wait a minute, you can put the, you can respond to that. And not only that, you can invite your customers in to a conversation, into a dialogue, which is so much of what this digital revolution allows us to do. So one of the very cool things that uh, you talk about starting is uh, having your customers send in ideas right. of how to make Starbucks better. Because it really is true. If anybody finds out that I know Howard, they're like, tell him that this is this, and this is that, and that is this. Right? That, like Everybody who works at Starbucks, you write in the book, has that moment where right. somebody tells you how, how, what, what, what they need to do, which, by the way, is a really good thing because it means people feel ownership, like it's theirs mm -hmm. too. So you found a way to really start a dialogue and use the internet and the web and the tools of social media um, in a way that is, that is not <laughs> kind of immediately obvious for a coffee right. company. I think that's cool. So can we talk, can sure. you talk a little bit yes. about how, what... Yeah. what that has done for the company in terms of its connection to your customers. Whatever business you're in or any endeavor that you are engaged in, uh, the, the issue of social digital media, that train has left the station and it is a runaway train and it's not coming back. And as a result of that, the, the understanding, the capability and the insight that goes along with emotionally engaging with people uh, through these channels is mission critical uh, to any, uh, any enterprise. Now, having said that, uh, the question was, what is it we're trying to do and why? Um, in the book, I write about uh, the fact that I sat down with Michael Dell and we were talking about him, what he did and how he came back and he shared with me something uh, that uh, uh, I think became a, a very primary tool for us and we basically launched an uh, interactive website called MyStarbucksIdeas.com. 
And it, it might sound kind of trite, but all it was at the time was an opportunity to create this feedback loop between our customers and ourselves about what we were doing wrong and ideas they had. Now you should understand that inside the company, senior people were very threatened by this and said, you're gonna open yourself up or we're gonna open ourselves up to tremendous criticism and we're not gonna be able to respond. And the irony is that's exactly what we needed to do. We were talking to ourselves and we needed to have the confidence and the faith that this kind of dialogue would be helpful to us. Secondarily, we created the same situation internally where we allowed 200,000 people also to give us their ideas and complaints and concerns. And this created a series of understanding about all of these things. Now, with regard to, to, to uh, the things that we're doing in digital media, uh, especially with regard to Facebook and, and Foursquare and Twitter, uh, here's the thing. People are looking at these channels as an opportunity to sell something, as an opportunity to create more revenue. That is a manifestation of these channels, but it should not be the primary reason they exist. The primary reason they exist is to share and engage with customers in a way in which you are making a deposit in the reservoir of trust as opposed to a withdrawal. And a withdrawal, every time you try and sell something or ask a, someone to do something, it is not building authenticity. So these channels for us have given us the ability to engage with customers in a very, very powerful way. A, a great example is the following. Less than 90 days ago, we launched um, a digital payment on your smartphone at Starbucks. Now, uh, we've been observing this in Korea and China now for two years where in these countries, the smartphone is their digital wallet. And over the next two years, we are gonna see that most of commerce that is gonna be done by all of us is gonna be done on your phone. Now, in less than 90 days, Starbucks became the number one company in America in terms of revenue and frequency of people paying for something on their smartphone at Starbucks. However, we were able to create significant awareness and relationships with our customers as a result of using social and digital media to explain it, to talk about it, and it had a life of its own. And it's a benefit to the customer. I think the, the idea that I think is important here is we are a big company. And what I was trying to do all along through the trans transformation is remind people about the entrepreneurial DNA of the company. And what I would say is the, the role of an entrepreneur, in an, whether you're a, a startup or a large organization, is to maintain significant curiosity to try and see around corners, to anticipate and understand what's coming, and then having the courage to execute. And I think innovation is, is monumental to the story that I described the last two years. And even though we're a coffee company and we're a physical bricks and mortar business, we must understand the sea change that is going on with the consumer. And we must be as relevant as any tech company because the consumer is not bifurcating what, what is a coffee company and what is a tech technology company. They're just living their life. And the question is, how can you be as relevant to them as a company like Google or Facebook? Because they don't discern one versus the other. They just want to do business and communicate the way they're living. And as a result of that, we felt very strongly that we must be as relevant with regard to technology and how our consumers are living their life as any technology company. And people thought we were crazy two years ago, but that's one of the reasons why we have done so well the past year. At the point that Starbucks started to falter, you were a very public figure. You were a media darling, I have to say. Um, you're very good with the media. Um, and you were having to, let's say, eat humble pie in some, in some way, or also, you know, kind of accept that the media w might turn against you and that you were going to face kind of the kind of criticisms that you weren't accustomed to. How, just in terms of your journey, in terms of building this incredible company and then facing this crisis and, and, and meeting it with the, with the kinds of, um, approaches that you talked about, 
put this in context of your life. I mean, was this one of the, the hardest? Was this the hardest period of your life? I mean, you know, you mm. start out, you don't have enough money, you don't have enough capital when you're just a few stores and you're struggling to get on you know, yeah. the ground. I mean, put, put it in context sure. in terms of your personal journey. Well, I think uh, starting a company uh, as an entrepreneur is in many ways much, much easier than coming back and trying transforming something in the middle of a crisis. However, this has been the most gratifying experience of my career. It's very hard when you are the leader of an organization and you're trying to create a vision, hope, and aspiration. And then the, the human behavior is we all have fear of failure. And there's no doubt that I had to summon every ounce of conviction uh, and determination to, to do this. But I, I think there's another piece to the puzzle. I mean, did you ever doubt? Did I mean, I, doubt? I wouldn't say I, I, I had my doubts, but I never doubted we could do it. But I, I need to explain something. Is um, You can't do something like this alone. Uh, you've got to surround yourself with people who have like-minded values and believe. Now, when I returned, I had 11 direct reports. And um, the first week I came back, uh, I stood up to the entire company and I apologized for the position we were in and the fact that we had let people down. And then I had a meeting with these 11 people. And I said something to them that is, uh, you know, this is going to be a monumental climb. And this is not for everyone. And you've got to ask yourself privately whether or not you're up for this, whether you believe in our capabilities and, and believe in me. And, and if you don't, if you really don't, then let's just have a private conversation because it'll be much easier if you come to me than if I come to you. Uh, <laughs> six months later, uh, I replaced nine of the 11. Oh my God. Now, not because I'm, I'm a mean-spirited person, but How I, many I, of those came to you? None. <laughs> Uh, but I, I think there's some. I think uh, there's something that's very important here, is uh, in a financial crisis, the leader needs to be decisive. People want to see and follow people who are making key important decisions. There's no there's no more important decision than the people who are leading the organization. And I didn't ask these people to leave because they were bad people. I didn't have the capability but they did not believe that we were going to be able to do this. And they had lost their understanding of what the company stood for. And we now have the strongest leadership team in the history of Starbucks because we have like-minded people who believe in our purpose and believe in building a company with a conscience and, and understanding what it means to build a company through the lens of humanity. They also believe that we've got capabilities now that we've never had before to do something really historic. But this isn't about one person. This is about 200,000 people who wear the Starbucks green apron and making them proud of the company. And I, I just felt like uh, the team around me was not going to be able to do it. And, and, and I would have we would not have been able to achieve what we've done if I would have just embraced the status quo of those people. What, what can you do today with a company in this remarkable comeback position? Uh, stock is back up and all the metrics that you want to look at are really healthy. Uh, how do you prevent something like what happened right. previously from happening again? Yeah, I think that is the most important question that we have to try and answer. It would be tragic if the lessons that we've learned somehow are repeated. And uh, I, I, I'm constantly sharing with our people, this is not a time to celebrate or take a victory lap. We had a record year of revenue and profit in 2010, and last quarter was the best quarter in the 40-year history of the company. But the, the, the fragility of the economy, the, the, the pace in which consumers change, is we have to do our work every day. Um, there is something else that I'd just like to just open up before we, we, we get to the question. So the, the short answer is, we, we just have to do our work every single day and, not, and understand that success is, is not an entitlement. We have to earn it every day. But there is one thing I just want to frame for you. And that is, um, the state of California is almost $60 billion in debt. And um, if we observe what has happened, what, was, what has been happening in Wisconsin and Ohio, 
uh, and this is not a political statement, the truth of the matter is that the, 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 at the state and federal level, the, the opportunity, because of the legacy costs and the insolvency of half the states in America, that social services are, are going to be significantly cut. And the question, I think, that is going to have to be asked and answered in the affirmative, and I was criticized for this last week in New York when I said it, is I think the responsibility on corporations to do more is going to be greater. Specifically, specifically, uh, uh, specifically for the people that they employ. And, and I think we are going to be witnessing in the next 12, 18, 24 months a significant pressure on states and local municipalities, and there's going to be really an, a very unusual dialogue going on about the responsibility uh, that companies and organizations have. Okay. Q&A? Yeah. Please. I have a question on diversity. Um, California is very diverse, and I understand that Starbucks's partner is Magic Johnson. Yeah. And with the growing census of um, Hispanics, how are you and Starbucks addressing um, the census? Uh, thank you for the question. I think it's a very important one. Um, we, we were highlighted last night in San Francisco for having three women on our board and six women as part of the senior team at Starbucks today. Um, uh, just to clarify, we have had a partnership with Magic Johnson and he has decided in the last year or so to, uh, I don't want to put words in his mouth, uh, to, uh, I guess, uh, get liquid in terms of his investment in the Lakers and also his investment in Starbucks. So we have bought, bought him out just recently. Uh, but the question about the Hispanic population and the growing Hispanic population, in, specifically in California, uh, we are trying to identify both opportunities in terms of what we can do within Hispanic commu uh, communities and then what we can do to attract Hispanic people to the company. Ironically, uh, this past holiday, we ran for the first time in our history uh, Hispanic television advertising, which did extremely well in the communities in which we were targeting. Uh, but I think this is a, a opportunity for us to do something we have not done in the past and we're very focused on it. Thank you. A little bit curious, I mean, in terms of writing this book, you're just pulling your head up above the, the water, and I'm trying to figure out, um, it's not like you're retiring, what motivated you to write this book now, and, and who's really the audience? Well, the question a lot of people ask me is, you started writing this book before you turned the company around, what, what, what would you have done if you didn't do it? And I, I, would, have, I would have just delayed the publishing of it. But, um, you know, I think the audience changed a bit as I was writing it. Um, I thought I was writing it for our people. Uh, you know, the question Sharon asked about uh, how do you not repeat this, I wanted this book to kind of be a resource and a legacy of what we went through for all the lessons and for the future of the company. But I think uh, after finishing the book, I think it's going to serve as a great tool to young people starting a business and people building a business uh, to understand the value of culture, guiding principles, uh, and really standing firm on what you really believe in. And, and, uh, and I hope that people uh, uh, view it positively uh, and you know, all the money's going back to our own people, so I'm, I'm really proud of it. Thank you. There are a lot of entrepreneurs in the room, and regardless of the size of our businesses, we've all been challenged tremendously over the past few years. Um, when you're by yourself at night and you go home, um, there's a human being there behind Starbucks, obviously. You're, you're the entrepreneur who created this, who's kept it going all these years. How do you find the strength and the tenacity to keep going when things are at their worst in your private moments, beyond the cameras and the stock prices? And well, I, I, think it's, I think it's important to share with you that you, you can't do something like this, whether it was from the startup phase or the last couple of years, w without having an unbelievable level of personal commitment. Uh, but to stand here or sit here before you and say, uh, I don't have insecurities or fear of failure or concerns would just not be truthful. Um, I think uh, 
there's a long list of people that I thank in the book, uh, very good friends of mine. And I think it was very important that there were opportunities with my wife, close friends, to really kind of bury my soul during this process and really be, have an opportunity to therapeutically talk to somebody because it's very lonely. Um, and there were a few people uh, who were incredibly valuable during that period because you do need people to talk to, to confess in. Uh, and, uh, but I think it does take, the entrepreneur has to believe more than anyone else because whether you're in front of one person or a thousand, you've got to provide people with hope. Now, I think, uh, what I would also say is you've got to put your feet in the shoes of your people and you've got to understand what they're dealing with and you've got to be able to ask the question and answer it in the affirmative what's in it for them and I think success is very shallow if it's not shared I think the stage has to be shared and and people need to feel as if it's not only about the entrepreneur or select group of people and I think uh, what I've also learned more than anything else over the last couple of years is the importance, the critical importance of making people proud to be part of something larger than themselves. Hi, sir. My name is Rudy Espinoza. I'm an urban planner, so I'm really fascinated with the city. Can you talk a little bit about how uh, the city and the specific neighborhoods inform how your stores are, are customized to meet the needs of the people that live there? Yeah. I know you did something in San Francisco and you changed the name, I think, of a Starbucks and you were really doing some experimenting there. Can you talk a little bit about that? I think uh, during the years of 2005 to 2007 when there was runaway growth, uh, we were just stamping out stores that just lost their personality and their soul. And I think over the last 18 months, we've done fantastic work about creating very relevant designs. I think the stores have to be really locally relevant, not only here in the US, but around the world. Uh, we've got a big business now in China, and those stores have to represent something that the Chinese people are gonna respect and feel at home. Uh, locations for us, we've been very good over the years of being able to understand where our stores should be. Uh, but I, I think that more than ever before, the ubiquity and the national footprint of the company uh, has to be subordinated by local relevancy in terms of design and community involvement. Thank you. Yeah. I'm Michelle from the Make-A-Wish Foundation, and clearly we have the heart of a charity. We appreciate the insights about running like a business. Um, I think you touched on it a little bit, but I am curious a little bit about the insights of changing the design of the logo. There's been a lot of discussion yeah. among a lot of people. And then just my other question is curious why they didn't serve start Starbucks coffee outside. This morning. Uh, why weren't they serving Starbucks coffee? Uh, you know, I, I, I take everything personally. And, and when I walked in and saw Pete's coffee, I almost turned around. Uh, but the, the issue of the logo, uh, we are. Uh, in the process of building a new business within the company. And that new business is a, a very large business within grocery stores. Uh, and in all probability, we're going to be creating products within food and beverage that will not have coffee associated with it. And so if the logo had Starbucks coffee words and the product didn't have any coffee in it, it'd be, it would be very confusing for the customer. So the new logo gives us the freedom and the autonomy to be able to do things. This was really a lot of discipline, a lot of thought went into this, a lot of research. And what we found was the iconic symbol of Starbucks, the two-tailed siren of the mermaid, was iconic and people know it's Starbucks, whether we say Starbucks coffee or not. You spoke about corporations becoming involved in the community and the services that we're going to miss. And I wonder if this idea is a possibility because I actually visioned it over five years ago. I went into the camps at Big Bear from the at, for the at-risk children and trained them in the art of storytelling. I labeled it Starbucks Saturday Storytellers. We worked on the world's wow. 100 greatest books, the world's 100 greatest people, the 50 greatest composers and their music. This gave them tremendous confidence 
And is the idea possible that they could go in and be paid on a Saturday morning and a Saturday afternoon to tell the wonderful stories that gives them the confidence and brings the community in to listen to our at-risk children? First of all, I think you were obviously ahead of your time. Uh, and thank you for the commitment and the compassion that you're showing to those at-risk kids. I think we don't want to prescribe something on a national level for all our stores to do because every community or, or relationship we have with our customers might be different in terms of the need. And what you're describing is something that our store managers or the district and region can do today. And it's just a matter of connecting you with the right person who's running our Los Angeles business, which I'm happy to do. We can do that afterwards. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to start off by uh, greatly appreciating your presence here. I, I admire you and your company. And my question for you today is, as a young entrepreneur, how can I best go forward with um, taking your recommendations in, in regards to building the Starbucks of the future? Thank you very much. You know, I've been asked, uh, I appreciate the question. I've been asked similar questions by young people uh, in the cities that I've been in in the last uh, week or so. Um, many people know that my story is I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, in federally subsidized housing called the Projects. And if, if you and I, if I took you to where I grew up today, you'd say uh, the odds on getting from there to here is just impossible. Uh, but it's not. And it's not because the, the entrepreneurial spirit and the American dream is alive and well. Now, um, I think there are many times during your life when young people perhaps are taught or told that the dream that you have for yourself might be too big or too grand and you should settle for something less. So the first thing I would say is, and you look like you're 25 or so, is uh, don't let anyone tell you that your dreams cannot come true. Yeah, even if it's family or friends, in all due respect. Now, I think you need to put yourself in a position to win though, which means first and foremost, an education that gives you the tools, the resources, the confidence, and the understanding of putting you in a position where you can uh, execute or go after that dream. Then I think you've got to surround yourself with people who have done something before with skills and experience that, that could be complementary. And I have a son who's about your age, and what I tell him, he's not involved with Starbucks, is uh, work for a company uh, at first that can give you the training and the discipline to understand how a company works. And then after that, after spending a few years there, perhaps then you can go out and do something on your own. But I think it's great grounding and in printing to work in an organization or a company that can give you future insight to do the things that you might want to do in the future. It took a lot of courage for you to come back as CEO in 2008. And in the book, you talk about the long-term commitment you've made to the board of directors. But one of the issues for a successful leader is management succession. Can you talk a little bit about the qualities you look for for someone to lead Starbucks decades in the future? Yeah. And do you think that person is at Starbucks today? Uh, I've also got this question a lot lately. Uh, so I, you know, I've, uh, I've told the board that I, this is not a short-term commitment that I'm here for uh, a long-term situation, but I think the question that you, you asked is, is a very important question, primarily because we're a public company, and that is the role of the CEO today, uh, what is really strategically important is succession planning. Uh, and I didn't get it right last time, but it wasn't because he was a bad person. I think I own the fact that I didn't put him in a position where he could have succeeded. Um, I think Starbucks will be best served if, if the future leader of the company does come from within. Having said that, uh, it's, this is not an entitlement. It has to be earned, just like I talked about success. But I think so much of what we have been able to do is linked to the culture and values of the company. And that culture and values uh, is something you can't learn coming in as an outsider and becoming CEO in a year or two. 
So uh, there's a, a very strong team with a number of candidates inside. I don't think anyone is running for office today, uh, but I'm highly sensitive and conscious of my responsibility uh, around this subject. And I, I think that uh, uh, every public CEO is wrestling with this, especially as you get older. I will say the role of a public CEO today has changed dramatically in terms of the responsibility, the 24 by 7 issues that go on, the fact that we're in 55 countries, there's a crisis every day somewhere, and uh, it, it's not for the faint of heart, and it, it does age you. <laughs> yes? I think this will just be the last okay. question, because okay. we've gone over. At the Drucker School, Peter Drucker wrote extensively about uh, management as a liberal arts. And in public companies, there's increased pressure on measuring the success of the company, and there go the CEO by some very finite financial measures and such. As a CEO of a public company, how do you measure, motivate your employees, your leadership on those unmeasurable things, the, one, the things you talked about earlier at the beginning? Could you highlight some of that? Yeah. Uh, it's a very slippery slope. Uh, when you're managing a public company because it's very easy to be seduced and intoxicated by the stock price. And uh, I've had a rule at Starbucks, and I say it's a rule, is I don't wanna see in any place within the halls of Starbucks any visual representation of the stock price. Because we are not here for that stock price. We are here to exceed the expectations of our customers and our people. Now, uh, we do a cultural audit every year to fully understand the responsibility we have to our people and how we're doing. We also are constantly measuring uh, the qualitative issues of the relationship we have with our customer around the Starbucks experience. We also have to measure how, how leaders and managers of Starbucks are developing people. Uh, and how we are developing people who can assume future responsibilities within the company. We're also measuring the attrition rate at Starbucks because of the cost of attrition and retraining. So I would say the, that Starbucks in, in many ways is an anomaly because we're such a people-based organization that the, the conscience of the company is so interrelated with human behavior and how we conduct ourselves that uh, this is something we got away from in the two years of runaway growth, but I think we fully understand that the stock price and shareholder value is directly linked to creating value for our people and value for our customers. Howard, thank you so much. Welcome. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.